Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I thought I would go through five things you won't find in this dermatologist skincare kit. Now, most of the time what I'm recommending to patients is in line with my own philosophy to my skin, um, you know, with some nuances depending on an individual's concerns. But most of the concerns that I have, namely aging, a tendency to blemishes, redness, and pigmentation if I let the sun at my skin, are the top concerns for most of you out there in one shape or another. So um, let's get to it. My first big no-no, and you will simply never find this in my kit, is a foaming cleanser. I have no place for this kind of product in my skincare kit. Now, foaming cleansers are cleansers made of surfactants that lather when you uh, mix them with water and are designed to remove um, oil and makeup and so on from your skin. But the problem is they take away too much in so many instances. Now my skin is very typical and I really do believe that at least 80% of the population has normal combination skin, which means they're a bit more oily here and they're pretty much normal to dry here. Um, it's just due to the natural distribution of sebaceous glands on the skin. Um, and I am very oily in my T-zone and I'm really quite dry and redness prone in my cheeks. So for me to start attacking this with something foaming would be at the severe um, detriment and dire consequences of this. So it's bad whenever you have combination skin, that's the first thing, um, and it creates an uphill battle when you then want to go regulating this and this with active ingredients because once you've got a discrepancy, it becomes much harder to use active ingredients like AHAs and retinoids. The second thing is, it's just not necessary with the kind of modern cleansers that we have nowadays, which can clean the skin perfectly well without the need to overdo things and leave you with that tight wind tunnel feeling. So foaming cleansers, big no-no. Next thing that you definitely won't find in this dermatologist kit, and that's something I just don't tend to recommend um, to my patients either, are physical exfoliants. That means exfoliating products that are gritty or have texture to them. And by extrapolation, um, this also means devices that would um, equate to physical exfoliation. The reason for this is that our skin barrier is there for a reason. And there's no doubt in my mind that the advent of an increased growth in the skincare market as a whole with numerous um, products for physical exfoliation now readily available has correlated to some extent with the increase in sensitivity in skin. It's basically the fact that the more we do to our skin, the more it goes, wow, stop it, you know, back off. There are so many patients I see for the first time that probably the biggest thing I do for them is to simply take away their products and give them a simple, supportive and non-abrasive routine. Um, and it really might be those things that make um, almost the biggest difference, at least in the first instance. And in particular, in those who've got thin, dry or sensitive skin, um, complaining of burning and itching and so forth. So. Step away from the scrubs, ladies. Um, chemical exfoliation can be such a powerful tool, and the reality is that most of the ingredients that we use for chemical exfoliation, which means using chemistry to dissolve away the skin cells' bonds, allowing the fresh skin cells to be revealed, so many of those ingredients also have additional properties. So you're not just getting one effect, you'll get a multitude. So one of my favorites, azelaic acid, as you all know, not only is it a chemical exfoliant, but it helps with redness, it helps with pigmentation, it helps with blemishes. Whereas physical exfoliation in those who are blemish prone is actually quite provocative and can drive you to yet more breakouts. So you'll never find a physical scrub in this derms kit. Next up, we have facial oils. Now, if you watch my channel on a regular basis, you'll know that I am not a fan of the oil. I know lots of you out there are and use them quite happily. But in my experience, both using them on myself and on the people I see in my practice, which is massively skewed towards the breakout prone 
um, grown up gals um, section of the audience, which I know is a big audience. Um, they just tend to cause problems. It's so hard to find oils that are convincingly non-comedogenic and won't cause concerns. Um, and by concerns, I mean that bumpy appearance in the lower face um, in combination with dull lackluster skin, um, because often oils are used as a part of a routine that is quite trend driven rather than being science based. So I think that whilst there are certain oils that are fine to use when formulated correctly in a moisturizer designed for blemish prone skin, using them neat and straight up is what I would consider a high risk activity. I wouldn't do it myself. That's my advice to you. Next up, we have spray on sunscreens. Now, again, sunscreen evangelist in the house. Um, and I like to be precise about my sunscreen. Now, um, in certain countries, sunscreen is literally viewed like a medicine. So imagine you are prescribed an antibiotic for your sore throat and you have the option of taking it in a tablet or spritzing it. Um, there's something lost in the precision of use of the tool whenever it comes to applying things in a spray. So I've just done a video on this recently, so we'll link up here to it. But when you need to reapply your sunscreen over the course of a day, because you know you're not gonna be in the office all day, you know you're popping out to a gym class or for lunch, please get into the habit of reapplying your sunscreen by using a tinted SPF that functions as foundation. That's certainly the way I've managed to make sunscreen reapplication work when it comes to the working day. So I can still look polished and pulled together if I choose the right product, but it enables me to apply a second layer as the day goes on so that if I'm about to be faced by midday sun, I'll have a fresh layer of protection on my skin and then I'll top up Colour Cosmetics on, on top of the new application um, of sunscreen. So sprays aren't precise. My personal experience is that they also don't have great delivery systems in the sense that you still generally need to rub them in to some extent. It's almost impossible to sort of spray a layer in a way that doesn't require some degree of dispersion. So in a sense, you're gonna to have to rub your skin anyway. So why not visualize the correct amount in your hand and apply it properly? Um, a Baby Beauty Blender is a great tool to carry around to kind of, you know, work in the edges around the temples or hairline where sometimes sunscreen can tend to collect. It's not a perfect system, but it's the one I found that works best for me. So sprays um, just don't really have a place in my kit. The other thing is I'm never quite sure about the level of UVA protection as they generally aren't zinc oxide based. Um, and that's how I rely on getting my UVA protection from my sunscreen as I seek out, seek out products with zinc oxide in them. The final thing that's a huge no-no for me and certainly something that I advocate to all my patients and to you guys is to skip fragrance, in particular in leave-on products. Fragrance has no value, it's a massive irritant, it's a common allergen and as soon as you start going, oh that's nice, um, I would urge you to move along and find something simpler and cleaner and go find yourself a dip tea can that you love burning if you need that for doing your product applications. So there you have it, five of my personal red flag skincare categories. Tell me about yours. I want to know what things do you avidly avoid or skip and why? Thanks for watching. Bye for now.